something that's how it okay, sounds. Okay, you'll never guess what. We have bigotry in America. We have Peter Hoffenberg and talk to us about it. He's a history professor, so watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Good to see you again, Jay. So let's, let's talk about uh, anti-Semitism today because, uh, you know, it, it keeps rearing its head. And uh, we live in a time when perhaps there's more than when you and I grew up. We live in a time, you know, perhaps when, you know, the, the late part of the 20th century, it really was improving. It was better. And, uh, you know, a Jewish person could feel that the, this was a welcoming country. Maybe most of the 20th century, it was always getting better. And now it's getting worse. Do you agree? Yes and no. So uh, you, you told people you to, be, to be warned, to be warned okay. as a history professor <laughs> that uh, on this hand, on the other hand, or an economist with three hands would be much easier. Uh, the statistics, so, so let me address what you said immediately. The statistics show a spike in what would be defined as anti-Semitic attacks. And I do not mean that in a snarky way at all, but we want to look at how things are defined. So officially, and probably still the most accurate chronicler is the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, mm -hmm. and their report from last year, which includes the United States. So they're not, they don't include Canada, for example, or Europe. They have different statistics we need to for those. That too, right, right. Um, and there have been Canadian incidents, but they generally look at um, the United States, I assume the District of Columbia, uh, and they show a spike in what they consider to be um, anti-Semitic events or experiences. So, for example, spray painting a swastika, uh, an attack on somebody who is Jewish, even though the person or persons attacking may not necessarily refer to that person as being Jewish. There could be other reasons. So that's why I'm saying, again, not in a snarky way, we want to kind of unpack. And certainly the impression is, and it's very accurate, that uh, the most horrific attack on American soil against Jews occurred in Pittsburgh uh, last year. Or th uh, th still this year, I apologize. Still this year. So all of those would paint a picture that uh, Jews are less secure in public than they were before. Um, and that's certainly fueling a sentiment that Jews uh, are vulnerable. Yeah. Um, my response would be, and it's not to disagree, but, but I put it in a complementary uh, mode or genre, all such attacks are more common these days, right? Blatant attacks against people of color, um, blatant attacks against uh, transsexuals. So one response is, is not just that Jews are attacked and that there's uh, anti-Semitism, that uh, the idea of a liberal open society is under attack mm -hmm. and that Jews are the canary in the mine for some people. That it's a sign that the notions of tolerance, uh, we don't all have to like each other, but getting along. Um, it's living here in Hawaii, for example, there's no place to go. You better get along. <laughs> You're not going to pick up your car and drive across the border. Yeah. Uh, so I would agree that the impression is, and certainly the impression is, um, that attacks based on some kind of difference are also greater. Now, if we look historically uh, and geopolitically, I think we could agree that uh, Jews in general in the United States are more comfortable and safer than in most of Europe. Uh, certainly there's been a lot of press about attacks in France and uh, comments we could talk about if you want about the Labor Party in Britain. So vis-a-vis -vis other significant Jewish communities, the community in France is large. The community in England has, has been there ever since uh, Cromwell invited them back in the 17th century. So we're talking about significant Jewish communities. My other point would be, and, I, and again, I don't mean this to be trite, but if we look at the entire history of Jews, particularly Jews in diaspora, so Jews have always lived in what is now Israel. They've always lived there, but a majority, of course, for many years lived outside of what is now Israel. These are probably still the best of times, and is probably still the best country in which to live in. And I, and I do not mean that in a banal or superficial way, but the average Jew living here as a Jew is still far better off. What about me. Canada? So Canada, um, I think it's a really interesting case because uh, Canada is a relatively open society. Diverse. Exactly, and the diversity is, is different. It, uh, than the United States is actually closer to the British model. And what I mean by that is if we took, say, two of the more, most significant 
Supreme Court cases about diversity, uh, Plessy v. Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Education, right? There are societies that think uh, separate and equal is the way to go. And to a certain degree, Canada, ever since the British in the 18th century said French Canadians can keep their language and keep their Catholicism, they've sort of had the British model, right? Uh, separate communities, they should get the same public support, um, they should be protected by the same laws, but there isn't the pull or push of assimilation. Yeah. That is, and I, I hope listeners will call and correct me, um, that's kind of a, and we're very aware about using the term exceptionalism, <laughs> even, if, even if it has failed in many cases, that has at least, at least been, we aspire to it. Or at least been part of the mythology, the powerful the mythology. mythology. <laughs> and, and good or bad, I don't mean mythology in a dismissive way. I mean ideas which, which could motivate us to be better, and obviously ideas which could motivate us to be far worse. Mm, yeah. But if you look at the history of Britain, I mean, one of the reasons Britain is having difficulties is that for years, um, communities were separate. Uh, Islamic schools had public funding. And uh, there wasn't really an, an attempt to assimilate. Uh, and I think Canada is more in that condition. And so um, attacks on Jews in Canada uh, historically have been, um, again, far fewer than uh, Europe. But there have been some interesting moments of anti-Semitism. And again, I want to be very careful here because historians are always wary of overgeneralizing. So oh. big G goes up. No. Not to overgeneralize, but there have been some historical problems in Quebec mm. and Montreal. I mean, with, with the, the Jews or with the French? With, Fran with the French and the French Catholics. Mm. Uh, Mordecai Rickler, the great Jewish novelist, wrote about this for years and years and years. Uh, and Mordecai Rickler act actually opposed the referendum to separate Quebec. Every 10 years or so, there's talk about that. And one of the reasons he said is uh, Quebecois are by nature essentially anti Semitic. So there has been, now, that's Mordecai Rickler, who was never subtle about even a tsunami. So I don't, I don't think that, uh, I, would, I would not take that as historical fact. I would take that as an impression about a kid who grew up there, was very perceptive, had a little edge to him, if you ever look at a Mordecai Rickler. But there were plenty of examples of that, and there still are today in, in Montreal. Mm -hmm. um, I think throughout parts of Canada, there's a, a more uh, traditional British anti-Semitism, which is really a quieter one, right? It's the comments made at the dinner table or not being allowed to join certain clubs. But I, I would be very surprised if a march like Charlottesville occurred in Canada. I'd be very surprised. I don't know quite as much about out, out west, uh, but certainly um, one hears very little about um, anti-Semitism in British Columbia. <laughs> one hears very little. Uh, there are not a lot of Jews in that big swath of uh, Alberta and, and cowboy Canada, but you just don't hear. There's great diversity there. There, there, there seems is. to be a great amount of tolerance, too. I think in, I think in general, if one you know, stuck a thermometer, a tolerant society, a thermometer in a society, I think you'd find that Canada. And one of the answers, and again, I, I don't uh, uh, mean to be quippish about this, is uh, <laughs> Canada has never felt the burden be a world power. It has never felt the burden that the eyes of the world are upon it. There, I think there are a lot of reasons that Canadians have kind of settled into. It's still relatively loyal to England. Um, and there are many reasons that liberalism and tolerance there are much more the, the British model. Yeah. It is also, of course, so let's remember, uh, where the Underground Railroad ended. Yeah, when sure. American slaves, African American sure, slaves. Sure, in, in Vietnam, and this is not a racist right. issue, but in Vietnam, you wanted to escape sure, the U.S. Sure. Right there. So I think, they but see themselves part, as a haven, right? And I think part of that is, um, you don't, you don't find Canada trying to police the world. You don't find Canada uh, trying to determine other people's policies. But we see they, they also, because of that, can't always go it alone. So Canada has to nudge up a little bit to the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> right. and they see themselves yeah. in the shadow of the U.S. Well, right. So whatever happens in Canada, there's, a, there's always a feedback kind of relationship with the U.S. Um, but, you know, I, back to the U.S. for sure. a moment. Sure, sorry uh, about that. You know, it strikes me that you say the ADL keeps uh, statistics right. on you know, certain kinds of visible uh, anti-Semitic uh, events. Right, also just, just to add a little sense, sorry to interrupt you, but also invisible and in that they also track online. 
Sorry. So they, they okay, track online. online. I'm not sure I know what that is. I mean, what, what is the individual event that they track online? So one of the things they track is hate. So they track uh, the hate sites that are explicitly about anti-Semitism. Uh, usually those that are about anti-Semitism are also racist. Uh, they also um, tend to be uh, extremely anti-women, extremely. So they track, it's not just uh, activities in the streets, but they try to track hate groups, and those hate groups often communicate via online. Sorry for interrupting. No, there's two they, questions they, they have a pretty up, big scope. Two questions that come out of what you say that I, that I think we should explore. Um, and I'll tell you what I think those two questions are. Uh, one is, is there, is there a kind of um, pinnacle here where you have this kind of low-level hate, dinner table, exclusionary type things, okay? And is that part of a pyramid? that takes you to a hate mm -hmm. website, uh, to people who have, you know, what do you call it, social problems, perhaps, or mental problems, and then finally express themselves in violence. So is there a pyramid? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess my second question is, um, you know, how does it work? What, what is that social or mental problem? Because this is not just one person, or even a community. This is all over the place, and it's been all over the place for a couple of thousand years. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least. So mm, I wanted to ask you about both. Let's go to the first question okay. first. Those the are two pyramid. important questions. The they're, they're related, but not, not direct. I mean, not directly. So um, I'm going to plead the fifth a bit about that and uh, rely more on scholars in communications and hate, etc. But I would say as a historian, what we've seen happen is, um, particularly with social media as part of that pinnacle, uh, less reluctance to express what would have just been the dinner table now publicly. The anonymity of it. Right. Um, allows one to, uh, for example, I had a discussion with a, a group at Temple Emmanuel. I mean, it sort of boggles the mind that um, an ISIS sympathizer, you know, in Paris, can email and agree with a white supremacist in Idaho. <laughs> but if, but, in common. Well, right. but in general, they would not. Mm -hmm. And in general, you would not see them at the same march. Um, if they were, you know, earlier during a time, they probably would not subscribe to the same uh, newspaper. But you're absolutely right. The anonymity or the uh, strength of the ideological connection transcend. Now, is there, uh, there's not a seamless connection um, to, get, to sort of give a kindergarten Freud, right? Uh, <laughs> The anti-Semitism and the racial hatred uh, is somewhere in our id. It's some kind of animal response, fear, jealousy, disaffection. Tribalism. Something like that. But uh, as a kind of rudimentary Freudian, um, there's also the ego which allows you and tells you that's just not proper behavior. That seems to be gone. <laughs> but fair. That seems to be gone. So in that pinnacle, the kind of editing, the self, but, but Freud would have said it's, it's self-editing. You got to, for example, um, you pull up to the stop sign and you know, nobody, nobody's there, but you know you're supposed to stop, all right? And that's how society stays together, that you stop. Or um, in Conrad's Hard Darkness, it, the society stays together because we agree that it's necessary to lie. It just is necessary. There's certain things. <laughs> Um, and those are all self-conscious, though, right? But what's happened to me, uh, and again, it's a very rudimentary view of mine, and uh, I'm sure many of your viewers and listeners will be able to correct me, um, the kind of self-checking is gone. And that's gone on a lot of things. Um, well, it seems and, and that's sort of the, that's where you could get from the, let's have a conversation around the dinner table, to I'm going to express it to my friends at school, or I'm going to go join a group. There doesn't seem to be any editing. Because, I mean, as a historian, uh, we're not going to get rid of hate. We're not going to get rid of intolerance. The point is, though, a society can't function if those things are publicly <clears throat> expressed or they're institutionalized or major political leaders, you know, exploit them. You, I, you, can't, you can't help what happens. In Everybody says it's a sine curve, right? There are some right. periods of time, the enlighten, Enlightenment, for example, where there's less hate and more collaboration, and you don't find that. Um, and, and I submit to you, and I'm interested in your reaction, there's two factors working. One is a cultural factor. 
So if I grow up in a household where I'm inclined to be, um, you know, a little wild and unstructured and, uh, and, and have those primeval thoughts <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, indiscretions. You're in. <clears throat> and my, my mother says to me, Jay, don't do that. And she inculcates that in, me, right. in, in, in me as a child. I'm less likely to entertain those thoughts, you know, unless I have a real problem with my mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I, am, I am less likely to you know, do that when I'm, when I'm an adult. I'm not going to participate in that because it's built in. Because, you know, like mammals, we get things built in in our childhood, and they last with us our whole life. The other factor I'd like you to address in this, this discussion, this particular point, is um, leadership. And we can talk about uh, American leadership. We should talk about that. But uh, if there's a leader, say Tito, Tito in, in uh, Yugoslavia, who says, now, now, I don't want you guys fighting. I really mean it. And if you fight, I, you know, I'm putting a lid on this. If you fight, um, you know, the Muslims and the Christians, whatever it was. And the Serbs and Croats. The, the Serbs and Croats and all right, that. Croats, if sorry. you fight, yes. I'm going to punish you for that. I'm your leader and I mean it. Uh, so don't fight. That has a big effect because that's sort of like, your mother and father <laughs> come current. Uh, you are not permitted. The rules are being established, and you cannot break them, or else there's a sanction involved there implicitly. Okay, so how do those two factors work, do you think, and how are they working now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they work in, in a couple different ways, and it's a very important point. I mean, the, the, easy, the easy answer is, uh, do we have leaders of particularly democracies who are uh, attempting to... Um, I think uh, unity is, is not a very helpful word because we're a diverse society, um, and we should be a diverse society, and that's healthy. Um, but uh, public acceptance, public tolerance, public decency, uh, those things that make for uh, a civ civilization, and that's not racial, Western, or non-Western. I mean, it's just simply the ability to have society function uh, in a way which is not anarchistic and is not totalitarian. Right, it's largely and I think, practical, and I think isn't it? particularly, um, it it sets a tone. It's a little bit like, say, the president of the United States and the economy. Really, the economy is going to function, and presidents get too much blame, and and too much uh, applause and credit. <laughs> but they do set kind of a tone, and so certainly uh, in a society where there are means of communications, and societies which, in one way or another, pay attention to what the leadership says, certainly. And I don't think uh, we need to point any fingers because it seems to be there's a very strong revival of uh, ethno-nationalism almost around the world, almost regardless of whether it's a republic, a dictatorship, a democracy, et cetera. So, it's not my imagination. Yeah, this no, is happening no, around the world. And I think a general consensus um, and happening in large democracies, uh, India happening in very large democracies, that's an ethno-nationalist movement. Uh, which is uh, historically uh, violently anti-Muslim, uh, as well as others, uh, the Hindu nationalist movement. I mean, uh, Gandhi and Nehru would be quite surprised. Is, is it a coincidence, it? Peter, that, <clears throat> that it's happening in, in so many countries at the same time? Uh, <clears throat> or is there some kind of connection, well, uh, there are, global connection? I would say it here again. I want, to, uh, I want to be very careful. I want to be careful with everything, but sometimes we can be a little um, more loosely. Uh, the perceived causes are in common. And no, I mean, that's, that may not be the precise <laughs> causes, per, but what we perceive and talk about at least, which is important at one level. So if you look at the various countries, um, they all uh, have an ambivalent relationship with globalization. People are taking our jobs. Uh, people particularly of another nation or another color are taking our jobs. And that's pretty pretty consistent. Um, each of them has, uh, has reached a point in their history where they're very self-consciously erasing and rewriting the past, in general, along some kind of uh, ethnic line. So for example, in India, uh, many of the, um, we use the word traditional, got to use that kind of carefully, but uh, the Mughals ar arrived in the Middle Ages, right? Mm -hmm. So there was not an Islamic India before. And the Mughals ruled um, really un until around, you could say, oh, middle of the 19th century. I mean, the, Brit the British East India Company expanded, but there was still somebody who could be called a Mughal emperor. <laughs> so at least until around 1800, probably, uh, they ruled. So what's happening, though, in many places is uh, the Hindus are, are renaming 
places as if the Mughal history never happened. Never happened. And we see that uh, when the Egyptians erased Moses' name. And he didn't exist. And one of the most brilliant moves politically of another generation, uh, Nelson Mandela, as the first democratically elected uh, leader of South Africa, the Republic of South Africa, went to the single most important Afrikaner site. It's the Vortrekker Memorial. And specifically said, I'm here. This is part of our history. Uh, but it should not be used <laughs> as uh, a shrine. So that, I mean, I understand why there's concern. I mean, there's concern in the American South, and not just the American South, because there are lots of statues in the North. I mean, there's concern that a statue of Lee is not a historical item, it's a shrine. <laughs> and that yeah. may be part of the difficulty. So it's not that it exists or not, or that it was built or not. It's not necessarily what happened back when in the 19th century. It's how you look at it today. Well, that, you don't want to pull it down because it's part of your, your, your past, right? Oh, it is, but the, I mean, we could talk about the Confederate monuments. They're a slightly different case because um, the two times in which there was a spike in their building were specifically two times in which the Klan had a spike. Oh, interesting. And coincided in the 1920s with very strict American immigration. So unlike in India, where the Mughals uh, inscribed and gave a name to these places when they came, the Civil War memorials are just as much memorials to these two moments in American history as they are even really to the Civil War itself. That's so yet that's another dimension yeah, on how you a, look at these right. things. Right, and I think that's an important dimension if the monument um, is used as a shrine. If it's used as a historical marker, then you can do what some countries did, like independent India took uh, the various statues of the British, Queen Victoria, et cetera, and put them in a park. You know what I like talking about? You know, make like a museum out of it or you, something Peter. like that. It's like spelunking. Have you ever gone spelunking? No, I haven't. <laughs> so with spelunking, you go into a cave and you have a right. little string that you leave behind, and then ultimately you really have to come back out of the cave. The Jews don't do it. Did you do that? Yes, I did. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's scary, but yeah, well, I'm going to feature you. I'm going to feature you. So a conversation can be like spelunking. Right. Okay. So we're going to come back out now. We're going to talk about anti-Semitism. Okay, so I agree with you, except that I would say we'd go to a coffee shop. Okay. <laughs> You'd rather do it in a coffee and shop. We decided, to go, we decided to go to the next coffee shop for the next discussion. Okay. Let's talk Let's, about Trump. <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the, the, the statistics are not conclusive, but they do suggest, the ADL statistics, they do suggest that Trump has an effect on on this whole issue. And I would like to explore with you that effect. Um, you know, he doesn't necessarily, he says, some of my best friends are Jewish. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that when anybody says that. Um, but, you know, then you find that in fact, he's somehow fomenting it. He's somehow fomenting hatred and racism and anti-Semitism. How does that work? And, and how does he do it? And does he understand what he's doing? And what kind of feedback is he getting from people who actually respond to it? That's another coffee shop. That's like the coffee plantation. I never promised okay. you a rose no, you garden. You did not. I don't really like roses that much. I prefer tulips. Um, all right. Let's, uh, where should we start? Because that's a very common discussion. I'm, I'm going to start with uh, almost the anti-response, is that we're focusing too much on Trump. Now. Having said that, we'll now focus on Trump. <laughs> okay, uh, what, what has been the impact of um, Trump? Well, I think, um, again, I'm not an expert in modern American politics, uh, so I hope some of my friends will respond. Uh, I think that Trump, uh, whether consciously with Bannon or not, uh, is playing uh, the, again, ethno-nationalist part. And anybody who plays the ethno-nationalist part, regardless of where they are, I mean, the Han played in China. We've talked about India. Uh, most Europeans are now playing it. The inevitable consequence, even if you intended it or not, the inevitable consequence is a resurgence of a hatred which has been there, an intolerance, an excuse. So whether or not you know, Trump believes it, uh, I look at Trump personally, and again, this is, has no professional affiliation, uh, as a 12 year old. I mean, he just kind of stopped. I might actually more mature 12, that's not fair. He stopped developing. I mean, he's a narcissist. Uh, 
cannot continue an argument. I'm going to bomb Iran. No, I'm not going to bomb Iran. That is a contrast to Obama, who was criticized for being too thoughtful, asking too many different views. And part of the Trump response, I think, is not just a racial response, which it clearly, clearly is. It's also um, this idea that experts and conversations and dialogue uh, do not really matter. I know what needs to be done. I have a gut. We're back to the it again. I have a gut idea about what needs to happen. Now, the problem is if it doesn't happen immediately, then maybe my gut will tell me something else. I think it's a mistake uh, for us um, to spend too much time blaming Trump, other than, again, setting a tone which allowed these things which have been on people's minds. It's not as if suddenly these hate groups arose, but they now live in an environment where they publicly express themselves. That I would fault him. Like I'd fault any... He doesn't condemn these actions, or at least not sufficiently. No. And, and part of no. what's happening is the lack of condemnation is giving uh, racists and uh, anti-Semites Everybody does everything with impunity these days. Yeah. No, nobody gets... I mean, I, I mean, no, what we know, need what, is Tito. That's what we need. You know, really. Okay. Somebody, you so, know, but I was so you can't do that. Right. So I was going to respond to that um, because what's coming up against this, and Trump knows it as well, is at least one narrative of freedom. However you define freedom, right? Freedom is states' rights. Freedom is to send your child to whatever school you want to send your child to. Uh, freedom is to own guns. Uh, freedom is to say what I want on the web. Um, so you don't even have to worry about that. There's no, there's no tradition of freedom in Yugoslavia other than uh, freedom from uh, Russia <laughs> or freedom from the Islamic Empire. Yeah. But that's a macro freedom. Uh, the United States, and so what Trump can, can fall back on is I'm you know, letting people be free. Yeah, I'm letting, uh, sure. you know, and I'm letting fetuses be free. I'm yeah. letting all these, I'm letting religion be free. And the... There's the kernel of truth, but the cob, the cob is big, and cobs have lots of kernels. Of course there's a kernel of truth in that. Of course there's a kernel that religious freedom uh, was important, of course. But societies have to measure the relative weight. And so is religious freedom more important than somebody's safety? Or is religious freedom more important than the public good? which should transcend that. So whose job is it to correct this? Not only in this country, but elsewhere. Not only with Trump, but you know, with it's other leaders job. that do not condemn it. It's our job. We have a ballot It's box. our job. What do we do? What do I do right you get after this show? Where do I go? What do I say? What out, do I do? You, you get out and vote. Uh, you, you get on the social media and be responsible and instead of so many people running around social media you know, like termites on meth. I mean, just... Uh, relax, step Tur back. I've been, I've been following, and um, your sister and I watched uh, a show about AOC. There's nothing, I mean, AOC cannot use underarm deodorant without Pelosi worrying about it or uh, Cheney's daughter saying, You're using Chinese underarm deodorant. People really need to just step Get a back grip. a bit. Just a grip. Like the problems are always going to be there. I know that. And there are some significant, there are some major issues. It's just I feel like, uh, you know, Yates did that uh, though, those who really want to sit down and talk about the issues and try to resolve them are just overwhelmed by people who are loud, running around. True, Peter. Um, parts like you and me, we can't manipulate the technology the way that no, but other we can, people we can. can. Search for advice. We, I, we don't have ready advice, but we can right. search for advice. And to know, and, what, to know what's good advice and not. I mean, part of, part of the issue of social media is the same issue John Stuart Mill and others had in the middle of the 19th century with an explosion of printed material. Not everything is correct. Not everything is truthful. Not all social media is good. Right, and not all newspapers in 19th century England yeah. were good, but they're out there, so how do you, how do you judge? And that puts an unbelievable burden and an unfair burden on our schools. That's why yeah, you it's an and unfair I burden. have to have more conversations. But, and we need to... We have to explore this, unpack it, explore it, discover it one step at a time. You know, make sure the schools are, are well-funded. Uh, I know there's a, a significant interest in STEM and kids going on to the STEM path, which is fine. But send a kid off the STEM path, 
you know, having read some Shakespeare, having read some Chinese literature. So they get an understanding of how, of the social context. I mean, when you get on your phone and you get on Facebook, it's not just a technological connection. It's a social and cultural one. And um, historical one too. Yeah, and the great they minds. They need to study history. The great minds across the world of, of all genders and orientations, the great minds can help us <laughs> negotiate that. There are new things, of course, but almost everything new ha has at least some old advice uh, towards it. Then you will yeah. come back. I will come back, of course. Thank you. Peter. Of course. But I have to wear this shirt. Of course. Okay. And me too. <laughs> uh, please do. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Okay.